Thanks very much. Uh, this is the last session, uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce in a moment uh, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. I just wanted to say, to highlight again, three of the sort of themes that have run through uh, the, the day uh, for the First Minister's benefit. Firstly, we have been pushing the case for action now, mainly by the UK government, but not exclusively by the UK government, to get on track to net zero so that the UK has a really powerful platform uh, going into COP26, showing that, that we've actually uh, not only talked about net zero, but we are on track to achieving it. Secondly, we have been pushing the idea of a net zero club which reaches beyond nation states and gets around the blockages that we anticipate from a, if Donald Trump is re-elected or from the Brazilian government or the Australian or the Saudis or whatever. And we reach out to uh, states, cities, provinces, progressive businesses who want to commit seriously to net zero uh, by 2050 or earlier. And that, of course, includes the four nations of the United Kingdom. And we also try to showcase... Uh, the, an all-society approach to COP26, uh, which is, I think, reflected in the panels and the audience we have here today, representing business, um, uh, civil society, uh, government, and uh, activists, and so on, and, and really saying this, is, this COP should be, has to be for uh, everyone. Um, and, of course, in, in terms of all those things, and particularly the... Uh, the idea of a net zero club. Scotland has shown tremendous leadership on climate change. It's created the Just Transition Commission, particular issue, I guess, in Scotland with the importance of the North Sea oil and gas industry. It's set a, zero, a net zero target of 2045, which I believe is the toughest statutory target in the world. And last, year's, last week's budget uh, also had climate action at its heart. And I think one of the problems faced by... Uh, London-based UK NGOs can be that often look, we talk for the UK, but we actually, in a way, talk for England. And Green Alliance has tried really hard to think about our responsibilities through Green UK and the other work we've done about all four nations of the United Kingdom. And looking to Scotland and some of the examples of climate action in Scotland is quite inspiring for the rest of the UK. You could say that more widely about the, the uh, Future Generations Commission in Wales and so on. And just trying to get beyond the England-only frame has been, is, is a really important uh, um, thing for uh, UK NGOs like Green Alliance. So uh, without further ado, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sean, for uh, setting the scene uh, so well, and a big thank you to the Green Alliance for uh, organising this event, but also, as Sean has just indicated, they're recognising in the UK context the four nations uh, element of uh, this work. I think it's really important, particularly in the run-up to COP, but of course thereafter, uh, that that is a, a strong recognition of the collective action we need to take in the UK. Um, you know, the importance of everything that you are talking about, we are talking about here today, really can't be uh, overstated. This is one of the, uh, in fact, not one of, this is the biggest challenge we face uh, both as uh, a country but also uh, collectively across the globe. And if we needed any uh, further evidence of that, and I don't think we did, uh, we certainly got it last month when we learned that 2019 was the second hottest year on record. And that confirms what we already know. This is a climate emergency that the world is facing. We need only look at the bushfires in Australia uh, or the rapid melting of sea ice in the Arctic to see some of the immediate consequences of this. This is not something far into the future. This is here and now. Uh, so the need for greater action and the need for much more urgent action has never been clearer than it is today. And that is why, in my view, COP26 uh, isn't uh, just the most significant climate change conference since the 2015 Paris summit. It is actually uh, more important than that when we consider the urgency of the challenge uh, that we face. And it undoubtedly uh, provides the world with an opportunity to agree new collective action uh, to meaningfully uh, and properly tackle uh, this crisis. Now, uh, there has been in the last uh, few days some 
uh, commentary and speculation about the relationships between the Scottish Government and the UK Government in terms of the planning uh, for COP. So I want to just at the outset be very clear from my perspective. Uh, I personally and uh, my government are committed uh, absolutely and unequivocally to working closely and constructively with the UK government and with other partners in preparing for COP26, preparing logistically but also preparing politically. Um, it's vital that COP is a success. It's a massive opportunity and uh, we have a duty, and I take that duty as First Minister of Scotland very seriously, to do everything we can to make it a success, because that's certainly in Scotland's interest, but it is in the interest of the UK as a whole, and perhaps most importantly of all, it's in the interest of the planet. Uh, now, no single country, and it's why COP is so important, no single country, and certainly not uh, a single country, uh, of the size and scale of Scotland can tackle climate change on its own. Uh, but every country, regardless of size and scale, has a duty uh, to step up its action and uh, make the effort to do uh, more. And for Scotland, uh, this summit is a big opportunity to highlight some of the work we're already doing, to be challenged by others to do more, uh, but to use our example to try to galvanise action on the parts uh, of others. It's a chance for us to show that just as uh, in uh, past generations Scotland helped lead the world into the industrial age, we are now helping to lead the world into uh, the decarbonised age. Uh, Scotland is already a global centre for low and zero carbon innovation. Uh, we continue to lead the rest of the UK in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And as Sean has uh, just alluded to, we recently set the most ambitious statutory targets for tackling climate change uh, of any country in the world. And when I say that, I'm not just referring to the headline uh, target, which I'll come back to in a moment, but in terms of some of the details. So our uh, 2045 net zero target, for example, how we measure uh, our performance against that includes, unlike uh, many other countries, including uh, the UK, it includes emissions from aviation and, and shipping. Um, and we also don't rely on international credits. We uh, calculate and assess our own performance on our domestic effort. And those facts, as well as the headline commitment, uh, I think lead us to say, uh, I think without fear of contradiction, that we are leading the world in terms of the scale of our ambition. Uh, but setting targets is the uh, relatively easy part. It's what we will do now and over the next few years to meet those targets that matter most. So I want to outline today just some of the specific action that we are taking. But I also want to say a word, because I think this is really important, about how uh, we're going to do that. And uh, obviously, in that regard, talk about the need to make the transition a just one uh, and a fair one, perhaps learning the lessons from previous economic and technological transitions which didn't have that principle of justice at its heart. Um, and we're also uh, very uh, aware of the fact that as we run up to COP and in the aftermath of COP, we need to work uh, with individuals, organisations and businesses across the whole of Scotland and indeed with other governments. We cannot do this on our own. Uh, but I'll start by just saying a little bit more about our new climate change legislation. It was passed in October last year and it sets the 2045 net zero target. So by 2045, it is our ambition uh, to be a net zero emitter of all greenhouse gases. And I've uh, already said about some of the uh, talked about some of the things that underpin uh, that uh, target in terms of how uh, we measure our success or otherwise against it. But Sean uh, spoke about one of the themes of this conference being the need to take action now. Um, even 2045 is not that far away, but it feels quite far in the distance still. So we are very mindful of the need to establish early momentum. So the interim targets uh, we have set are to us uh, just as important as the 2045 target because they will determine whether or not we meet that target. So we have, uh, as part of that legislation, set the target of a 75% reduction by 2030. And what that does is put significant pressure on us to take the action that we need to take now and front road as much as possible uh, the things that we are doing. 
Uh, I also know you've been discussing, and Sean uh, mentioned it there, the idea of a net zero club. Uh, Scotland would be delighted to be one of the first uh, countries to join that club. Uh, we have, uh, for a number of years now, been part of the under two coalition, so we have already got quite significant experience of working uh, with uh, sub-state uh, governments. Uh, we uh, have done a lot of work in particular with California in the United States, uh, recognising that in a, an age where the, uh, the national government in the United States, how can I put this diplomatically, may not be as on message on these issues as we would like them to be, working with uh, states in America and other uh, subnational uh, governments is really important. So we'd be delighted uh, to play a leading role uh, on that. Um, we recognise, and I think it's important not to shy away from this, that meeting the targets we've set will not be easy. It requires fundamental change, change to how we heat our homes, how we travel, how we design our towns and cities. Uh, we've already set out a lot of the detail of how we intend to do that through the uh, embryonic Green New Deal that we have uh, already uh, discussed. Uh, we've already made a great deal of progress in terms of our electricity supply. We already uh, get 75% or thereabouts of the electricity that is generated for uh, Scottish consumption comes from renewable sources. So the progress in Scotland in decarbonising our electricity is already uh, well advanced. We need to replicate that success in every other area as well. Um, that's why the budget last week uh, that was outlined in the Scottish Parliament has uh, climate as it, one of its key uh, and central themes. So, for example, in the budget we announced further investment uh, around decarbonising the transport network. Um, I certainly welcomed uh, the announcement recently that the UK government intends to uh, ban uh, petrol and diesel cars and vans earlier than they had previously talked about by 2035. We already have a target to phase out uh, new petrol and diesel uh, cars and vans by 2032. So we're already stretching ourselves in terms of that. Uh, we're expanding uh, a programme, and this was talked about in the budget, to provide uh, loan finance for people seeking to buy electric uh, vehicles. We're working with the energy companies in Scotland to make sure we're doing the work on the infrastructure uh, that is needed to support that. Uh, the budget also delivered additional investment in energy efficiency programmes and district heating schemes. Scotland is not unique here in recognising that one of the biggest challenges we face is around heat uh, and how we uh, will heat our homes in the future. Um, and it also delivered uh, 20, uh, so 250 million pounds uh, commitment over the next 10 years to restore our peatlands in Scotland because our land use and land mass is one of the key reasons why the Committee on Climate Change uh, concluded that Scotland could reach net zero earlier than uh, the rest of the UK. Uh, in the most recent year, I think more than 80% of all trees that were planted in the UK were planted in Scotland. We're increasing investment around forestry, but peatland restoration over the next few years is going to be crucial. Uh, in total, the budget uh, that we set out last week uh, increased our capital investment in the energy transition to £1.8 billion over uh, the coming year. And the Committee on Climate Change said, after hearing the budget last week, that it shows Scotland is serious about the scale and importance of the net zero challenge. So I think the early action we are taking is right and appropriate, but we recognise uh, in terms of bringing the investment that is required here, we still need to do much more. Uh, you may know we're in the process of establishing a, a new national investment bank in Scotland, a public uh, state-owned bank that will have the job of providing uh, patient long-term capital. And its core mission, it's a, a mission-led bank, its core mission will be supporting the transition to net uh, zero. And we also know that public investment has to play a big part in levering in uh, private finance as well. I mean, the Committee on Climate Change estimates that 85% uh, of the total investment we are going to need to support the net zero transition will have to come from the private sector. So in Scotland, we are right now establishing a green investment portfolio, a £3 billion package of projects 
that will cover areas like heat, waste, power generation, property. We'll bring that to market later this year uh, as part of our effort to uh, generate the private investment that we will need to see. Uh, we're already one of the best countries in the world uh, to invest in low carbon or net uh, zero projects. And this green investment portfolio is really designed to make sure there is an awareness of that um, across the world. Um, now, I've already said, and I think I can say with some confidence, although we uh, need also to learn from what others are doing, but the different elements of what we are doing, I think, does put us at the forefront of the battle against climate change. And I very, very strongly believe that, first and foremost, this is a moral imperative, and I don't use that phrase lightly, but it also represents a significant opportunity. Uh, you know, if we lead the net zero transition and the countries that do lead the transition uh, stand to create jobs and prosperity, uh, as well as reducing pollution and waste and improving people's health and well-being. So there are big benefits and opportunities here if we get it right. Uh, but we're also mindful of the risks of getting it wrong. And I know that's uh, something you've been discussing today as well. Um, I grew up in Ayrshire in the 1970s and 80s and you know, saw firsthand, as many others will have done in communities the length and breadth of the UK, the impact that deindustrialisation uh, had there and the impact of a transition happening in ways that is not just and fair. You know, fear of unemployment, reality of unemployment, and many of the communities like the ones I grew up in still bear the scars of some of that today. So we must, in my view, uh, do everything we can to ensure that the transition to net zero is handled very differently. Uh, we've got to uh, do everything possible to make sure that communities and individuals are not left behind, which is why in 2018, we took the decision to establish a just transition <laughs> commission. Uh, that commission is, uh, its work is well underway. It includes representatives from business trade unions, the third sector that's chaired by uh, <laughs> Professor Jim Ski, who is a co-chair of one of the working groups for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It will publish its first interim report later this month. And its job is to advise on how we can ensure that that transition happens in a fair and just way and putting people and communities right at the heart of that. And, you know, the importance of doing that, of putting people first, is one of the reasons why I think it is so important that we all make sure that COP is an inclusive uh, exercise. Uh, each and every one of us, and I'm talking here as a, an individual citizen, not just as a, a politician and the first minister of a country, we've all got a big stake in the outcome of this. And we all have a part to play in, in tackling climate change. So we must make sure that these debates and the actions that flow from them uh, include people uh, with no disrespect to the many experts in this room, but get beyond rooms like this to galvanise uh, the population as a whole. Uh, we already do what we can to contribute to that at an international level. We've, for several years now, provided funding to the Women's Environment and Development Organisation, which is money that helps women from developing countries with the financial and logistical expense of attending climate change summits. And we also want to encourage and improve participation uh, within Scotland. So we'll be holding a, a broad range of events and activities, uh, both in the run-up to and during the summit, helping to ensure that people from all sections of society feel that they have a part to play in this. Um, to conclude, uh, before we go into the discussion, uh, I think in so many ways, the Green Alliance actually <laughs> exemplifies the kind of movement that we need to create around this. Uh, everybody in this room has already demonstrated a commitment and you are also uh, a hugely powerful voice for change. Um, and I think it's important as a politician to acknowledge that it is absolutely right and essential that some of what you articulate is not comfortable for governments because it is pushing us to go further and faster. And that is absolutely uh, essential. So I want to just leave you with a message today of the Scottish Government's commitment, not just to the targets that are absolutely essential, but to the hard work that is required uh, to be a country that leads the world on the journey that is 
not an option and is absolutely essential. Uh, we are a friend to you in all of the work that you are doing and I hope you continue to uh, challenge us um, and to be such a powerful voice for the changes we need uh, to see. And uh, I look forward as well as seeing you today to seeing all of you in Glasgow uh, later uh, this year as hopefully we have uh, a COP in uh, my home city uh, that can play such an important role in the change uh, that the world needs to agree to. So thank you very much indeed for the invitation. That was tremendous. Thanks so much for that. Uh, it's great to hear not only about the, uh, the, the climate action is, is a priority, and an urgent priority, but also about the, the stuff you're actually doing, not just talking about it, but getting on and doing it. So, fantastic. Thanks very much for that. Um, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. I'm going to take them in groups of three, uh, starting with the press, the first three. Uh, <laughs> yes, Fiona. Uh. Um, Fiona, Harvey from, Fiona Harvey from The Guardian. Um, can I ask, what do you make of uh, Boris Johnson's government's handling of the launch of COP26 so far? Can, can we take them together? Is that all right? So we get more. Ma Ma Michael there. The, uh, well, okay. Hi, <laughs> Total Clyton, Daily Record. Uh, First Minister, I, I hear what you say about working cooperatively with the UK government. But if that's the case, why is your government involved in a turf war with the UK government over who flies the biggest flags over Glasgow in November and a squabble over the price of policing? The, the conference. And I hear what you say about 75% of Scotland's uh, electricity being renewables. What part does nuclear play in that? And what is the SNP's policy on nuclear? And then Michael, and then we'll... Can you pay? Sorry. Um, Michael Settle from the Herald. Um, I was just curious as to whether the Prime Minister's taken up your offer of Rosanna Cunningham attending his cabinet on climate change. And were you offended at all by the slur that emanated out of Whitehall regarding the wee Jimmy Cranky woman? Comment. The questions are all going to get much friendlier. And, uh, we're, we're going to Believe me, it's not the friendliness or otherwise of that question. It's just, for goodness sake, guys, we're here talking about the future of the planet. <laughs> I will answer it. I, I, I was talking about the last point there, but I will answer your questions. Uh, okay, okay, fair enough. Right, let me answer the questions uh, properly and, and fully. In terms of the, the hand, look, I, I was and am concerned about the Claire uh, Perry, uh, Claire Neal. Uh, Situation. I, I think it is concerning that the president of COP is basically removed from uh, her job, uh, and that raises concerns. I hope those concerns are put to rest later this week when we see the new president appointed and you know things are clearly on track. I have no um, interest in, in being critical of the UK government's handling of this. I desperately want COP to be a success, um, and I feel a responsibility for helping to make it a success. And. You know, in terms of uh, the question about Rosanna Cunningham, my uh, environment minister, I have offered uh, that she would attend the cabinet subcommittees that Boris Johnson has said he will be convening. And I, I do that not just so we're involved. I think it's important that we are involved because of the location and the, the, the impact on devolved responsibilities um, and therefore working really closely together matters. But it is also actually because... I feel that sense of shared responsibility. You know, the, the Scottish government, not just on the logistical side of making COP a success, but also in using our experience and, you know, the recognition that I think there is of Scotland's global leadership on this to help deliver the political success of COP. So I, I make that offer as a genuine one, and I hope to uh, answer Michael's point, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't had a response to that yet, but I hope it is a constructive uh, response because it was an offer that was made uh, constructively. Um, Torco, I don't, I don't consider that we are engaged in squabbles. I'm certainly not aware of any discussions about flags over COP. Um, and the issue that has uh, arisen is, uh, which again just seems you know, ridiculous, but again, we're keen to have a discussion that resolves it. Uh, after the UK government uh, booked the 
the, the accommodation for the, the COP site, which uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to go into the, the ge geography of Glasgow here. They, they booked this sort of site on the north side of, of the Clyde. And after they'd done that, we decided it would be good to have a Scottish government presence. So we booked the uh, Glasgow Science Centre, or we, we entered into a partnership with them, which is a, a facility on the south side of the Clyde. Uh, they then decided they would want to extend the COP site to the south of the river and to take in the Science Centre. We've always been happy to have a discussion with them then about how that is used. But the idea we did that to get in the way of the planning a COP <laughs> is just ridiculous. And, you know, I don't really want to be... Ha I think these issues and, you know, my, my comment earlier on, um, I guess is born of a bit of... These shouldn't be, and I absolutely appreciate as journalists you want to ask me about this. I have no... Uh, complaint about that, but we shouldn't be. It's not your fault, but we shouldn't be talking about these issues. Um, and I am absolutely uh, not just willing, but really keen. If if there is a sense of squabbles or not working constructively, let's reset that and just move forward in the right spirit. And I'm saying again today, that is what I want to do, and I hope the UK government meet that with uh, the same spirit. And if if that's the case, then the next time I'm sitting in front of an audience like this, I won't be having to express frustration about getting asked questions um, of that nature uh, when we should be talking about the bigger purpose of COP. Um, and generally, I, I'm not going to comment on, you know, if, if Boris Johnson wants to make personal insults against me, I mean, I'm, I'm a big enough girl to make personal insults against him back on other <laughs> occasions, right? <laughs> And, but you know what, on this issue, I don't want to be doing that. There are plenty of issues that Boris Johnson and I can have squabbles about. <laughs> this really, really should not be one of them. So that's the point. Thank you. We're going to get... Nuclear. Oh, I forgot. On nuclear, the SNP is against new nuclear uh, power generation in Scotland. We have the two nuclear power plants uh, already operational in Scotland, but we have had... Um, as a long-term policy position uh, similar to the one we've got now on, on fracking in terms of a planning assumption against new nuclear uh, generation. Uh, given Scotland's renewable potential, that is what we should be focused on. If you look at the cost differential now, if you look at the nuclear development uh, at Hinkley, uh, you know, it, I, I think it makes no sense to be investing in that at a time when we should be investing in realising the huge renewable potential we have. Great, thanks. We're going to take on saving the planet. Brenda, then Sarah from RSBB, and um, yeah. Uh, Brenda Boardman, University of Oxford. Uh, we hear discussion that what is really needed is a 7.6 per cent per annum drop in CO2 emissions across the world per annum. In view of that, what would you like to see as the newspaper headline after COP26? Hi, Sarah, Sarah Whitebread from RSPB. Um, we've been talking a lot today about nature-based solutions to climate, so I've got a question about the kind of twinned um, biodiversity and uh, climate crises. Um, and in that context, really great to see the stuff um, last week in the budget on peatland restoration. Um, but what about um, the tree planting? Because it's fantastic, the amount of tree planting in Scotland, but a lot of it is obviously non-native um, conifers and so on. Um, so it would be fantastic to see a percentage of that for native plantation that really worked for nature as well as working in combating climate change. Thanks. And there's a man just in front of you with a sustainable development goals badge. Um, uh, Libby, Libby is, is there? Pass it on. Yep, thanks. And then we'll... Uh, Chris and Barnard. Then, and then I'll go to the um, cheap seats in a minute, okay? So <laughs> wave. Uh. Uh, Chris Barnard, president of the British Conservation Alliance, a student-led organisation... Uh, we've heard a lot today about involving various levels of society in the COP discussions. And as a young person, probably one of the youngest in this room, I'm wondering how exactly should we, would, should we be involving young people and students in the discussions at COP? How should they be part of this debate? Because we're, at the end of the day, the ones that are looking at our future here. Okay. Um, thank you. Well, in terms of the newspaper headline, I, I should say for the... Uh, as a journalist, no, I, I, I'm not responsible for writing newspaper headlines, which is probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> but I think what must come out of COP, we must come out of COP with uh, a global uh, agreement that is not just about you know, the, the targets that we're seeking to meet, but detailed plans and actions that the world is committed to that will, at an absolute minimum, meet the obligations of the Paris uh, Treaty. And, you know, that has to be 
the, the goal. And that, I don't think that would make for a particularly snappy newspaper headline, but that's what we've got to be aiming for. Now, I don't think anybody uh, underestimates in any sense the challenges of that. You know, we are not in the most conducive uh, global political environment for this to happen right now. So there are big, big challenges along the way, which is why uh, the president of COP, when he or she is announced later this week, uh, has got such a, a big job of work to do. And, and there is a real need and obligation for us to support them in that task as, as much as possible. Um, I 100% agree on the biodiversity point, um, which is why you know we've made the commitments we have around uh, peatland restoration, which is a, a big commitment. but you know, right and proper and will be very important in terms of our ability to meet our targets. And I do agree with you. We've, uh, in the budget last week, we have also increased the funding for tree planting, but it is important that it, that's about quality, not just quantity. And that's an important part of our consideration. How do we get more native species uh, in uh, that, that consideration? So th that is work that is very much uh, uh, being taken forward by the Scottish Government and the I think we should see the climate crisis and, and the biodiversity issues very much as one in the same uh, challenge, although obviously the, the action that is required differs. And sorry, young people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I would like to see, and again, you know, this is obviously for um, discussion in terms of the UN and the, um, the UK as, as host country. I would like to see, I've, I've attended three previous COPs, you know, there is great energy amongst young people around uh, these events, and that's good. And I would absolutely expect that to be the case in Glasgow. But I think we really should be thinking about how we have the, the youth voice, if I can uh, put it that way, much more embedded into the negotiations and the, the discussions that then influence the outcome of that. I, I can't sit here and tell you right now exactly in a, a structural way how that will happen, but it's certainly one of the things I'm keen to see us push forward. OK, two or three more really quick uh, questions. There's a uh, lady in the stripy top, top, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's what it's called. And, and, uh, um, and then a couple of rows down, and then I'll come back to one of the journalists. Uh, Hello, Francis Williamson from Chameleon Technology. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you said that it's, um, the Scottish government's approach is all about putting the customer or, the, or people at the centre of um, the commitments to meet net zero. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how you're going out to communities, either very urban or equally very rural, potentially very unconnected, um, communities to help them realise when they've got major challenges on their day-to-day -day lives, why it's important that they get involved. Great, thanks. Ruth Bergen, and then I'll come down to this man from Scotsman. Uh, Ruth Wave, um, they don't know who you are. Uh, the microphone's coming the other way. And, and then, um, is it Niels? Yeah. Uh, Ruth Bergen from the Trade Justice Movement. As someone who works on trade policy a lot, something that's really apparent about the Paris Climate Agreement is that it's not enforceable, um, in contrast with trade agreements, which are very much enforceable. And what's very noticeable from a, a sort of Scottish or a regional perspective is that whilst you have powers to do some things about climate and the environment, you don't on trade. And so potentially you're in the position of being challenged via trade for things that you do on climate and, and the environment. So my question is sort of first, how do we give this some more teeth? How do we make it more enforceable? And what does this club, this net zero club do uh, about this kind of contradiction between trade and climate? Truth in the, um, yeah, that man there in the check shirt, I think it's a check shirt, yeah. Uh, and then... That's it, I'm afraid. Thank you, Paris Gortzianis from the, from the Scotsman. Uh, First Minister, your government was warned before it embarked on the Queen's Ferry Crossing project that it would increase uh, emissions and traffic. Uh, and this year it was confirmed that it produced one million additional private car journeys despite a promise that it would increase uh, public transport. Do you regret that given the targets that um, you've set? And as a result, would your government call in and reject planning permissions for any new bridge across the Irish Sea? Just pass it to Adam, because I did um, promise Adam one. Really quick, Adam, one sentence. Yeah. Uh, Adam Vaughan from New Scientist. Um, should the UK's new climate plan, the NDC in UN jargon, should it just be a copy and paste of what's in the carbon budgets already for the UK, or should it be something genuinely new and more ambitious? 
Great, thank you. And can, if I just add one, Nicola, um, you won't be able to answer all these, but if, if the UK government doesn't embrace the idea of a net zero club, will you as Scotland? Uh, Scottish yes. government. Um, I'm, I'm Drive happy. it as one of your themes for the COP. Absolutely, I'd be happy to take on responsibility of pushing that forward um, because oh, yeah. you know we've benefited from these kind of uh, dialogues and forums in the past, so I'd be really delighted to do that. In short answer to that question, I don't think copy and paste can be any part of this discussion. We need to significantly up the scale of what we're doing in every single area. So anything that's just about taking what's gone before and seeking to replicate it is almost by definition not going to be sufficient here. So I, I, I think the, the term copy and paste should never feature in any of, of what we're talking about. Um, the, the, the point actually about trade and uh, where's the person who asked me about the trade? Sorry. Um, about trade and climate agreements and the differences in enforceability is a really, really important one. I should put my cards on the table. I don't always agree with the enforceability uh, provisions in trade agreements, investor state dispute resolution and such like. So I'm, I'm sometimes a sceptic about the, the means and methods that are, are used there. But I do think there is a big issue about the enforceability and the teeth that we have in agreements of the nature of the Paris Agreement. And I think that is something that increasingly has to be part of this discussion, not just what are we prepared to commit to, but how are we all held to account on that and what are the consequences of us not uh, doing the things that we've said we would do. Um, and it also brings into sharp focus one of the other things that is a, you know, a, a constant um, consideration for a government like mine. We have some of the powers here, uh, but we don't have all of them. So if you look at the Committee on Climate Change report that recommended the net zero uh, targets, it was very clear that for Scotland to meet our target, we require the UK government to do certain things. You know, the decarbonisation of the gas grid, uh, you know, work around accelerating uh, the progress on electric vehicles, which they are now doing. So we are really interdependent on this. Um, and, you know, I think as we go into... Uh, a post-Brexit UK world, some of these issues around the role of governments like uh, the Scottish Government and the other devolved nations in the UK in trade agreements and how these things are enforced and how within our powers that we are held to account in these things is very, very relevant, obviously on climate change, but actually it goes much wider than that. So I think it's a really... And actually, things like the Net Zero Club are useful forums to bring these issues uh, much more to the fore and for different... Uh, governments in different uh, environments to actually share some thoughts on how we, we tackle some of that. Um, and uh, lastly, on the, the Queensferry crossing, um, look, I, I don't regret, we, we've got to keep Fife connected to the rest of the country. We needed to make sure that there was a, a reliable crossing. Now, I'm, I appreciate it. I'm speaking about this on a day when ice and snow has uh, caused that bridge to be uh, closed at uh, the moment. Uh, but in first time it's been closed for weather since it opened because it is much, much more reliable than the crossing it replaced in terms of uh, wind uh, disruption and, and such like. Uh, but of course, the existing fourth bridge is now a, a public transport uh, corridor. So we have to get the balance. There is no doubt transport emissions in Scotland is not unique here, have been rising, tackling uh, transport emissions is a significant part of this challenge. And we've got to make sure we're investing in the alternatives to people traveling uh, by road. One of the things, today, the uh, UK government announcement on the five billion for uh, bus infrastructure, we made a similar announcement to that back in September last year, the 500 million pounds commitment to invest in bus infrastructure to make bus services more reliable and, and quicker. So that kind of investment is crucial. We've got to have a country that keeps connected and keeps moving, but we have to shift as much of that and do it as quickly as possible into much more sustainable forms of transport. And the other, I was coming on, I was, I was not going to miss the opportunity to comment on the bridge from Scotland to Northern Ireland. Uh, don't push it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm really ambitious for Scotland and its connections with uh, our closest neighbours and, and the rest of the world. Uh, I think to say there are some big questions around the feasibility and the deliverability of <laughs> the suggested bridge from Scotland to Northern Ireland would be an understatement. I mean, it, far be it from me to point out that this would not be the first bridge that Boris Johnson has promised and failed <laughs> to deliver, so he has something of a track record. Look, if he wants to 
uh, prove that it can be done and it's feasible and deliverable, then, you know, let's see where he gets to. But this is, you know, it's deep water with a munitions dump uh, at the bottom of it. I think there are some big questions. And I, I guess if I was uh, saying to him, look, if you've got 20 billion pounds available to build a bridge, I'm pretty sure me and I'm sure equally the First Minister of Northern Ireland could find lots of things to spend that on right now that actually would be really useful in accelerating the progress to net zero. So um, there you go. Um, I'm happy to take the 20 billion, Boris, but maybe not spend it <laughs> on your latest bridge. Thanks so much for that. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Before, before everybody dashes off, can I just say a couple of things really quickly? Firstly, thanks again to the Network for Social Change for supporting uh, Carbon Carbon Now, and it's an open partnership. Anybody else can join. See me after. Uh, thank you to Schneider Electric for um, funding the conference. Thank you to Paul McNamee, whose swan song this is, as head, uh, head of politics. He goes to work for Deputy Mayor of London on Thursday, so thanks, Paul, for all you've done. And I'm afraid Dustin Benson, our policy director, who spoke in the morning session, is off on a year's secondment to DEFRA, but will be back. And I should thank all the staff at Green Alliance who have organised this, particularly Ollie Mount. It's been a tremendously difficult event to put on, but I hope it's been worthwhile. I'd like to thank all our speakers. Above all, I'd like to thank you, the audience, because I think the energy and ambition that's come out of all the sessions today has shown that really we can get everybody behind a really successful COP26 in Glasgow. And arguably, this is the sort of the event the UK government should have been putting on on an even bigger scale in the last few months. But uh, we, if, they don't, if they don't gather everybody together again in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll try and do it again uh, uh, and, and check what progress has been made. Uh, and lastly, again, thank you so much to the First Minister for her speech earlier. <laughs>